good friends, fellow lovers of science fiction, horror, of film in general. I want you to pay attention to who I'm about to introduce you. I've known this guy for 20 plus years, probably longer than that because I'm older than I like to think I am. But where we are is in a time and space. And I always say I love being alive in this time and mainly because of technology and access. And so our friend on the show today is film writer, director, producer, Dallas Jackson, who has not only gone from being basically bony T in the mailroom to director and all the way up. He is making movies, delivering them so that they go into digital and in theatrical release. The latest of which we were blessed and privileged to get a screening of is The System, starring Jeremy Piven, Terrence Howard, Tyrese, and Lil Yachty. Lil Yachty. Dallas Jackson, welcome to the show, sir. What's up, fellas? This is a privilege, man. Bruh. You know, I'm a fan. I, I see what's happening. I always want to know why B is in his closet. But, I mean, <laughs> look, I'm just going to let that. Don't let know, it go. I can tell you exactly why. This is the best sound in my whole house. You will not catch a reflective sound source in this room. My sound bounces off of clothes and never comes back. So when people Copy aren't that. watching, they're just listening, I sound better than both of y'all. <laughs> Copy that. I'm going to let you roll with that. But that Maybe. is actually your physical, like, you go in there and get suits out and and yeah. everything. That's yeah, the these are the suits. Those are prop suits. No, this is the deal. This is the closet. Yes. It's a big closet. It's probably big as a bedroom in here because I live in North Carolina. So we have space. That's a benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, a it's three suits, times bro. bigger than you think it is. You got a lot of suits in there. There's some suits in here. A lot of hats, too. Bro, let me just start yeah. by saying I am very proud of you. Mm, And not that I had anything to do with your development. I'm just proud to be a person for whom you'll still pick up the phone. And I'm also proud to have witnessed and continue to witness the work that you're putting in, in pursuit of your vision. So why don't we start there? When you're, when you're wildly successful as a filmmaker, what does that look like? What do you want to do? Well, look, I'm still hungry, bro. I'm eating everybody's plate. So I, I don't consider myself wildly successful yet when you put that terminology out there i'm looking at spielberg and tarantino and maybe to even certain degree fuqua when that term is thrown out i want to walk into netflix and amazon and they go let your imagination run wild and we'll write the check that's when you know you okay we're we're somewhere i'm in a path right now where the past 15, 20 years have been dedicated to, and like you said, I'm maybe even longer. I like to think I'm younger than I am, but the past 15, 20 years of grind, of creative output, of picking up the phone and calling people who don't know who I am, of writing when I didn't want to write. And I enjoy writing, but sometimes you just got to still keep grinding at 2 a.m. Yep. All of those things that I've started that I, I was on the path to do are now starting to pay off. So I'm in a space right now where I have gotten over the hump of trying to prove who I am to get an opportunity to now proving the continuous bets on me. You know, you get one opportunity, somebody else bets on you for another opportunity, that opportunity pays off, someone else bets on you for another opportunity. So now I'm in the proving myself phase of the creative work that has been put in. So I feel like what it looks like to me right now is more work, more creative output, more focused creative output. There was a time where I was focused on strictly scripts. Now I'm looking more like at the bigger picture of production, like who's my next DP on my next movie? Mm -hmm. who's my next star on this next movie what's this tv pilot that i want to cook up i'm looking in more of a macro space of the brand and how do i continue to elevate it because i do get these people that are now betting on me to actually go out and make projects let me just be clear 10 years ago after to a certain degree proving myself as a writer And even given the opportunity to remake The Last Dragon at Sony, I found myself in a one-bedroom apartment with my family in a hole. Money had ran out, 
and I thought that I was already successful. And I found out the hard way I was not yet. Things can still go awry. And what that did for me was prove that you cannot let your foot off the gas at all. And you cannot believe the hype of where you are. Because at any moment, it can go left and you can take three steps back. And if you're not prepared, I'll find myself right back in that one bedroom apartment with my two babies and wife. Right. And so that's why when I when you say wildly successful, I'm like, hey, hey slow down now. No, no. But it was a question. Can, the the you know, question but, was. But I, but I understand the question. The question was, yeah, it was to say when you are like when you at the point in your career, when you will allow yourself to say I'm wildly successful as you envision it. What does that look like? So I wasn't putting a label on you because I don't want to put that that label on your back yet. You know, I get it. Wildly successful to me looks like Tyler Perry. Okay. My own studio, my own ability to green light, my own ability to buy projects. I don't have to go out and pitch to studios. I can option material myself. You you, you and Mo come to me with a comic book you've created, and I go, okay, I can write a check for that. Don't we play, because we coming. <laughs> right. To me, wildly successful looks like my version of Tyler Perry, my version of Spielberg and Amblin and DreamWorks. To me, that's where I want to take DJ Classics, which is my company, into a production space where I can not only acquire material, but green light it myself to put out for distribution. I have a question because I think of us, right, we're Gen X folks. And uh, yeah, y'all keep dancing around it. This is our fourth decade of friendship. I ain't going to say that too long. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, we have known each other for a while. And for those of us who are black and grew up Gen X, we consistently have the emotional trauma of you have to work twice as hard to go half as far. Our Mm -hmm. parents consistently, the boomers are like, hey, (laughs) you're not successful unless you are Tyler Perry. And one Mm -hmm. of the pushbacks that I've had to figure out for my own life is to say, yo, I'll never get to wildly successful. You're on a pathway where you can get to wildly successful. But what does successful look like? Not successful in terms of like, this is disappointing because I am not running my own entire studio in the state of Georgia and green lighting every movie I want. But what does successful look like? Sure. Look, successful looks like where we're at right now. You know, Mm -hmm. we're being recognized by our peers for the work we've put in. There's a a certain amount of people that I can call, they'll pick up the phone, as B mentioned. We're continuously given opportunities now to create. The business has changed over the past 10 years of being more purposely inclusive, purposely diverse as a mandate. So that gives us opportunities. We don't need the handouts, we never did. We just needed the shot to get in. And so right now, success to me looks like, I mean, look, I'm talking to you guys in my own home in California. That's hard to do, right? I spent the better part of my life out here renting. So to have a home, to have some posters on the wall from productions, to being able to think about what the next movie is going to be, that feels successful to me. I'm always cautiously optimistic because I have more to do. That is our parents on our backs a little bit and in the environment we grew up in. But for me, I'm in a position right now where I want to make sure that we're planning smartly because, you know, to take a lesson from our parents, just to speak personally for my parents, I wish there were some things they had done to plan better for their own future so that I am not the nest egg, right? Yeah. Even though I don't, I don't mind that. And that's a responsibility I take on with pride. But there are things I feel like our parents could have done to put themselves in a better position for their own future. And so lesson learned, note taken. And now we try to correct that for our children. We're in a better position than our parents were, knowledge wise and information wise to make that happen. I was having a conversation this morning about your movies. And when I saw you last time, I said, I'm going to show up to every one of your movies, Mm. right? And because I said that just two weeks ago to you, I then had to go back in time because I hadn't seen Welcome to Sudden Death, Mm. Michael Jai White remake of Jean-Claude Van Damme, who's Maurice's favorite ballerina um, and his role model. 
<laughs> what? It is a what? dance. I mean, it, it is a dance. Don't take that too disrespectful, Mo. I Listen, bet you he wouldn't say that to Michael Jai's face, though. Not Michael right. Jai, John Claude Van Damme. Oh, Jean Claude. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. say it to his face either. But yeah. you know. <laughs> but here's the comment and the compliment from this morning. Going from "Welcome to Sudden Death" to the system, you did a four X on one particular variable, and that is. When I saw Welcome to Sudden Death, I pretty much knew one actor. And when I saw the system, I knew the first four. That's a 400% increase of people who not only will take your call, but will take your check and be involved in your project. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always looking for where are the measurable growth points and are we capitalizing on those? So congratulations on that. How do you see that? Well, let's back up to Thriller, which was my first movie that Blumhouse allowed me to make for $1 million. It was nine fifty actually, nine hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. that they gave me to say, okay, if you can crack this code, go make this movie. And I was able to crack that code with a great line producer and, and producing partners who had done micro budgeted horror movies, and I was able to get that opportunity because Blumhouse had read a script of mine and also knew about my association with John Singleton. So the opportunities. As I mentioned, now, Blumhouse gave me that opportunity because they had Get Out coming out. They smelled blood in the water, and they didn't have anything diverse on their slate. So they were out kind of searching around, and here comes a young brother from Howard that has some filmmaking experience that is currently working with John Singleton on a show called Rebel. He's in the screenwriting realm in terms of selling scripts. Let's give him an opportunity to direct. That turned a corner for me. Now, Blumhouse made their money back because Netflix stepped in and bought it before it dropped. The license period is off for Thriller and Netflix now, so I think the movie's moving over to Peacock. But you can watch Thriller on YouTube. You can rent it on YouTube, I think. But it's moving to Peacock because a Universal had something to do with it. But I say that to say I was able to pull in RZA on that because of our relationship over the years. And I was able to pull in Michael T. Williamson, who's known for Heat and Bubba Gump Mm -hmm. and primetime work that he had done a purge movie for Blumhouse. So you got a brother making this movie for under a million. We pull in some names. Everybody else was pretty much brand new uh, because of a teen movie. So that movie talking about, you know, one bet leading to another bet, the executives from Universal 1440, which is the streaming division of Universal, saw that movie, read Last Dragon, and asked me if I would be interested in remaking Sudden Death. Now, whether I had an interest in remaking Sudden Death or not, I'm going to take the bet. Of course. And right. I'm, and I'm going to try to make it mine. And so that opportunity, being able to have a little bit of a bigger budget, uh, Sudden Death budget was $5 million. You know, Michael Jai was a safe bet for Universal. I needed an actor and a martial artist. And what Michael Jai didn't know and what my secret to that movie was, it's a comedy. Not going to remake Sudden Death and come at it in some you know way that's harder than Van Damme. I'm going to come at it with an action comedy. I put Gary Owen in as a sidekick. And even to the certain degree of the family aspect of it and some of the way I shot some of it, it's a comedy. Yeah. But what I gleaned from that movie and that experience was being able to do action sequences and fight sequences. And I had proved myself in a dramatic realm on Thriller. Now I'm proving myself in an action comedy realm. And so when the system comes along, I'm basically infusing everything that I've learned up to that point, except for I need stars. And you can get stars if the material is good and the wallet who's backing your movie can go get those stars for you. So the system was a little bit of a graduation because mm-hmm. it wasn't a remake. It wasn't something I was had to be responsible to in an IP way. I wasn't limited to $950,000 as I was on Thriller. I mean, there's budget limitations, but I was pretty contained in a prison. We shot in a real prison in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And so... That movie allowed me to put everything on the table, including the opportunity to do a little bit of a sci-fi kind of action thing in this prison, you know, escape from New York, if you will, spin on the average prison movie and gave me some creative freedom. Nobody gave me notes. Nobody said, how about you do this with Terrence's character? None of that. I had creative freedom. 
Awesome. And that was the progression and the graduation. And it started with Blumhouse giving me that opportunity for less than a million dollars. Because there is no sudden death without Thriller. Last time we talked, you definitely described yourself as I'm doing horror from a brother's perspective. And I, that has bounced around in my head for a while. And I know one of the questions I asked you at the time was, who do you see as kind of your predecessors role models? You said John Carpenter, you mentioned Robert Townsend, you mentioned Keenan. And I had one more that I want to add to the list and see how it bounces off you. Robert England. Uh, do you about Freddy Krueger? Well, Freddy's the character, but Robert yeah, as a filmmaker. Yeah, we're talking about the same guy. Just make it short. Yeah. Yeah, look, I would I would say I have several influences. One being Wes Craven, who did write Nightmare on Elm Street, who did write Scream. I would definitely say James Cameron. I watched Aliens till the tape popped, you know, literally. I would definitely put George Lucas in there. I'm there for every Star Wars, good or bad. So all these things of us being Gen X, definitely. Robert England, yeah, bro. When I say horror from a black perspective, I'm saying like, where's the brother Freddy Krueger? Candyman and all that stuff. Candyman is all we got. Right. At the budgets that you've been uh, able to make movies and get them mm -hmm. produced and get them out, if Dallas Jackson goes back and exists in 85, you're a monster today. Right, because those movies at those budgets fit right in. That market exists at the time, and then it grows, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering two things. How do you feel about the idea that had you existed 20 years ago, had your dad or grandfather been able to do what you're doing, where would you be today? And then also, what advantages do you have doing it today versus doing it back then? Does digital help you? How do you move this thing faster than waiting 25 years to be incredible like I know you'll be? Well, I think that it's a give and take because in the 80s, you had to step through with Eddie Murphy. You know, you had to step through in a way that justified box office and home video. They would run both those numbers, right? Ice Cube changed the game because he financed his movie and put it out through his record company Priority. And then New Line stepped in and said, we'll distribute this, right? Master P... Same thing, no opportunities. He's going to make his own opportunities, which, you know, Master P let me in the door with a film called Uncle P that I wrote for him. And I also did this movie for him called Bout It, Bout It 2. But Bout It, Bout It 2 is interesting because that was something he decided to distribute himself. And then he wanted to go find a studio to put out Uncle P, both of which he financed. To answer your question, the opportunities now are greater the home video numbers dictated what was popping in the 80s. Because if your movie flopped like Scarface, but then it cracks on home video, Brian De Palma is still Brian De Palma because he's killing 60, 70 million on home video, even though Scarface only did like 25 at the box office, mm. right? For our brother, we wouldn't have got that opportunity. You'd, you'd have been one and gone. You had to hit out the park or not. Right. And the, Streets is littered, Maddie Rich, a whole bunch of cats that only got one shot and never came back. Now, because of the advantage of technology, and, uh, and as we say, we love living right now, it's streaming. Streaming mm. has taken the place of home video. So if you can justify your last movie streamed so many times on Netflix, generated a certain amount of revenue on iTunes, you will get another opportunity whether the big studio comes or not because you are generating eyeballs towards a certain platform. Right. So we're in an era right now where there's more brothers making films than ever because of the opportunities of streaming, because of the multi-platforms out there that we can take advantage of. And it's not just Lionsgate or not just New Line making the brother movies or Screen Gems when they started jumping in on all the Vivica Fox stuff or whatever. So I, I would say to get in the game now, there's more reward than risk because the risk of before was if you did not make that home video number and make that box office number, no one's going to give you another opportunity. Mm -hmm. And also in the 80s, you had to make a decision in the 90s as well. Are you film or TV? Because if you were TV, 
they weren't really giving you no opportunities for movies. You were relegated to that space. Now we can jump back and forth. Shonda Rhimes can make a movie and a TV show. Right. There's a lot of brothers out here that are bouncing back and forth from directing TV to directing movies. So the opportunities now have increased. So for someone like me who was studying the game, who was preparing for the game, who was waiting for coach, put me in coach. Now all I got to do is just go out and shoot these hoops, you know, but it took a long time to get in the game. Yeah. But I think that had I got put in the game earlier, I would not be in the game right now. You've been talking about uh, the 80s. We talked about us being Gen X and the hip hop generation. In the boondocks, Ed Asner was the main villain. And at one point, one of the plots and one of the, the stories, he steals Riley's lemonade stand, right? And he mm -hmm. grabs a glass of lemonade and he's like, lemonade was a popular drink. <laughs> and it still is. You mentioned Dallas letting aliens, letting the tape rock till the tape pop. Mm -hmm. One of the gems that people are going to love from this movie that we saw during the screen and the responses, you know it already, is with Jeremy Piven. Without mm -hmm. giving so much away, I'm really curious, how much of that was you speaking through him mm -hmm. to give homage to everything that we are, 80s babies, hip hop generation, and how much of that was him recognizing it. And then the last part, if you've got an actor like an Ed Asner dropping a, a line from Guru, right? Is it better if they do have the recognition and they're kind of in on it or if they don't get it at all? So that's actually a fantastic analogy. Jeremy is one of those rare gems that he comes prepared. He's ready to rock. He shows up early in the morning he looks like shit because he was probably out doing whatever he does the night before but he comes early he comes to set he looks like the dude that you wrote on the page mm. and he comes ready to play so if you ain't ready to rock with him he will eat you alive as an actor because he is a trained actor so what i did with jeremy was i asked for what was on the page give me that and then I'm gonna give you one. And I do this with all my actors. We do three takes, cause I gotta keep it moving production wise. We can't stay on one scene all day. But I give my actors three takes, two for the page, one for you. Mm. So that means say the lines that are on the page, hopefully you've memorized them, and then do what you wanna do on that third take. And Jeremy's third takes, were usually the ones I ended up with in the movie. <laughs> That's great. Because he would just he would just go ham with his improv. And that's a skill that is slept on as an actor, the ability to improv within the scene. And so sometimes he would fuck somebody up like Tyrese, because Tyrese would be like, well, cut, wait, what he that's not on the script. And he'd be like, no, it's not, bro. So just keep rocking. And Jeremy would say, it's called improv, dude. <laughs> and another thing that people don't understand with Jeremy is he listens to hip hop. Okay. He is a part of the culture. Yeah. So in the movie, when he quotes Biggie, that's one of those third takes. And I say, go do what you do. And awesome. he gives me something. And I'm like, damn, that's great. And when I get to the editing booth, I'm like, yo, just play me his third one. I don't want to <laughs> even see the page. Let me just see his third take. Yep, right. that's it. We take, we're going to put that one in the movie. But he is a rare gem that brings so much fun to this movie that I equate him to the Joker. He's the villain you love to hate, yeah. but the movie's not the same without the Joker. That's true. He is the, he is the Joker in this movie. Where should people be watching the system? The system drops November 4th. It's on Amazon and Apple TV. So you can go to Amazon Prime, you can go to Apple TV, you can buy it, you can rent it. We will eventually land on a streamer for free, like Netflix or whatever, first quarter uh, 23. But for right now, to go get this thing smoking hot, Apple TV and Amazon. Hey man, talk about the business model when you're given that very small budget. Like what numbers or percentage are they expecting you to return in order for you to get that second bet? With the system, the, the movie's budgeted out 
and they're saying, okay, the movie six million, we can pre-sell that around the world before the movie's released and get our money back. Mm -hmm. So anything on top of that is gravy. Within that six million, two million is allocated to go get the stars to go justify the international sales. Meaning you need two brothers and a white guy to make it simple for you that can take this thing and sell it around the world and get their six million back before it even drops. So they run numbers. Sam Jackson, Terrence Howard, Will Smith, Ice Cube, Tyrese. There's a like about eight or nine brothers that have international. Marlon Wayans. That means that they can go crunch a number and that will mean a certain money in territory in Ireland. That means certain money in Australia. That means certain money in territories of Africa. Jeremy Piven, they crunched that number. Okay, he's been in XYZ movie. He's been in this uh, TV show that's traveled to these territories. So that $2 million off the top goes to my three stars. Now they have a package that before I even go to shoot day one, has already hit the black because they pre-sold the awesome. movie already. Right. So when you go sell, and this, this is another thing, we weren't considered international in the 80s or 90s. So that's where the tables have turned for us to be able to do this because international foreign sales companies wasn't giving anybody that looks like us a second look. Now I got these cats wanting to do my next two or three because they know they can sell my product around the world. They just did it the first time. So they take that package, they pre-sell it. First day we're shooting, then they start to entertain the platforms because they've already made their money back. So anything after that, domestically, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Stars, the, the network, whoever is the highest bidder is who they negotiate with. And then you add an extra two or three million for licensing on top. So it's a game that they've been playing for years. They're just letting us in the game now. Because now we are international. Now right. we drive the culture. Who's the biggest two stars on the planet? The Rock, Will Smith, and Denzel. Mm. They all black. In case right. you forgot. <laughs> I love it. Do you have your next two or three lined up? You know what you want to do next? Yes, sir. This is something that Kenny Gamble told me. He went to Howard. First brother I knew, like personally, to sell a script. He said, you sell that first one you have that second one already on the shelf. So I've just been banking them for years. You know, there was no time where I stopped writing. And JP Morgan wants to come through and lay down a hundred million. I got eight or nine lined up mm -hmm. scripts. Hey man, if you need a couple news reporter type, uh, you know, whatever you need, we showing up. <laughs> I got you. Money. I got you. Yeah. I heard Mo wanted to spearhead the next, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Did y'all have a whole that? <laughs> he said he wanted to get in costume and get his Donatello on. I'm going to on that IQ. This is when you know people for too long. They can fire off all types of short jokes. See, I could have said, hey, man, listen, you know, look, if you put me in as an extra, just don't put me on a box if I'm standing next to B. Just, you know, just let me be short. This man fired off. Lo <laughs> Love it. One of the things you said, Dallas, just the notion that you are breaking ground and you are worthy of being honored by our alma mater amongst other illuminaries. And it's, it's on one hand dope to hear you talk about yourself and where you would have been if it had been the eighties and what you're capable of doing and what you're looking to do. And those things are just so Howard. And it's also distressing that in 2022, as accomplished and as successful as you are by your own description and by what everyone else has seen that we're still breaking ground. You know, we're still naming all of the black folks who are yeah. involved. And so um, there's no real question of that. That's just that's just a shout out, a toss up to you, man, just to say it's great and terrible. And <laughs> we appreciate the fact that you're doing that in the legacy and the lineage of everything that we grew up with. Yeah. And let me say this, you know, it's not easy for white folks either. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, I mean, getting a movie made is like winning the lotto. It's, it's like sure. hitting hitting all these different things and catching them in a bottle and then asking lightning to strike that bottle. <laughs> now, the thing that you get good at is putting these things all in the jar and it starts with the material. If you can get good at that game, you can start to figure out how to put the pieces together. 
but it's hard for everybody. But for us, it's extra hard. So we have to be extra diligent, you know, and it does come down to that theory of we have to be just as good or even better, like our parents told us. Yeah. And that's kind of the superpower that we got from Howard is to go out into the world and know shit isn't going to be easy, but we have the confidence to go out and achieve it. And I carry that with me even into this day of figuring things out. That's why homecoming for me is a reset because I, I get so caught up on like, why aren't I in this place or why is this hard to sell or whatever? And I go back to homecoming and I'm like, yo, we started right here. We didn't have nothing but a dream and classes and friends and tuition. And we figured that out. So to go out into the world and come back from that, it recharges my battery mm. and and makes the problem look smaller. So I say that to say to all the dreamers and the people who watch your podcast and have aspirations, don't let the odds stacked against you deter you from that dream because the odds are stacked against everybody regardless. It's just a matter of, are you going to be consistent with that dream? Are you going to take an hour every day to be uh, dedicated to that dream? Because if you do that, I guarantee you those hours will add up and you will get closer than the person who is not consistent. I appreciate y'all, yeah, man. man. I love y'all brothers. Uh, you can edit out the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle joke. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm definitely no. editing it out. Bony T as well. I, I just okay. throw shots. Yeah, you can keep you keep Bony T. It's all good. <laughs> I worked Bro. in the mail cart. That's real. That's <laughs> that was real. I wish we had Instagram back then. I would have definitely been showing myself pushing that mail cart. I'm gonna be a Ninja Turtle. So shit, let's go. Bro, <laughs> if I come to you and say we got that IP. Let's go. I, I want you to say let's go. Hell yeah. <laughs>